The topic of the panel is ostensibly uh, where in the stack does security belong. However, um, that's a very broad topic and you can pretty well take any question and, and claim that it actually fits into that, that general topic. So I'm going to ask the first question. I'm going to ask it of the panel in general and I'm going to ask at least two people to answer it and everybody who wants to answer it will get the chance. Uh, anybody, who never, anybody who doesn't answer any of the questions that come up or s state an opinion on, every, on anything is immediately disqualified unless nobody wants the thing, in which case they become the prime candidate. <laughs> well, um, only one of us is Aust is, lives in Australia. Okay, anybody in New Zealand? I, I live in Australia. Say oh. what? Mm. I just asked. Yeah. Uh, you asked. Well, you don't expect him to yeah. give you a straight <laughs> answer. <laughs> oh, I thought you were asking him, so you'd like no, him answering? No, no, it's okay. Oh, so two of us are. That's good. Okay, but that's okay. All right. So you, can, you guys, if you win, you get, to give, you get to decide who gets it. Or give it to the audience. Yeah, yeah that's oh, what I was going to say. The audience could, might be better. It could be anybody in the room. Okay, okay. The winner gets to decide who gets it. Which might be himself, yeah. Including themselves. Yeah, they're, right. All right, so here's the first question, okay? If we could give you an operating system that didn't do any access control of its own, would, but ran at twice the speed, uh, would applications benefit or would they um, be indisposed? And I'll leave that to, to the panel, okay? We've got, we have a volunteer room. Do you want to first? Uh, uh, well, I'll just start off, but I think, first of all, I'm probably the most inexperienced among this panel, so my answers might be slightly skewed. So, but in terms of what he said, um, I basically think that it, it needs, you need to look at what kind of application you're looking at. So if you're looking at something like high performance computing or something like that in a standalone environment, I would probably say performance, I would take it. But if I, the general use case and uh, for normal purposes, I would say no, because I think, uh, personally, I think the sacrifice in performance for security is almost always worth it. So does that cover the answer? Okay, so who wants to take it next? Okay, uh, well, um, I'll interpret the, the question as meaning that uh, you have, a, a, uh, have to authenticate yourself to log in, but after you log in, there's no access control, so there's no uh, user IDs or anything like that. And um, for a reasonable number of servers, th they don't pr productively use access control. For example, if you have a, a DNS server and all it runs is your DNS process and nothing else, then that's either working or not working, and if that gets compromised, then uh, whatever else you have for, for access control isn't going to do anything. Access control is really useful in the operating system when you have the option to do more than one thing. And if it does exactly one thing, one process running and nothing else, then you're a bit limited to what you can do. Uh, what you can do, you can stop the, uh, an application compromise from trashing logs and things, but there are various ways people have come up to, to deal with that. I've heard people talk about um, having an operating system booting from a CD-ROM or a DVD, so it can't write to its media. All it can do is run this one application that's important, and it could then send its logs uh, to another machine off-site. Uh, so in these uh, theoretical cases, uh, access control won't uh, do much good. However, these theoretical uh, cases don't tend to, tend to happen in real life. So in real life, uh, you actually want access control everywhere, every time. But also in terms of being double the speed, the only way in which you can really double the speed for uh, realistic cases, it seems, is uh, for file system. Uh, for everything else, the operating system in almost all cases uses such a, a small amount of resources that it's just almost un, uh, impossible to measure. Only file system operations are slow enough that you can actually double the speed, really, in any uh, likely situation, I think. Okay. I, um, I actually am, uh, am interested in the assumptions that are being made. So we're assuming it's a <laughs> server, right? Because uh, no. if it's a mobile phone, that's pretty much how most of them work. Right? There's no user to log in, right? Maybe there's an authentication login, you have a little password or whatever, and yet the applications are all there and whatnot. And I assume there's some kind of thing so that my Facebook application can't see what my Twitter application is doing. Um, but who knows what Apple's putting there? Um, <laughs> and if I'm using Facebook and Twitter anyway, right, I shouldn't assume any security. But I mean, the idea is that that's kind of how mobile phones already work. I wouldn't say necessarily double the speed. The other thing is if it's a personal computer, I mean, I don't know about you, but my parent, well, my, my father and his wife, does, they don't lock their computer. My mother has a work computer, so it's locked. But, um, but she told everyone her passwords, or all her kids, so we could use the computer, which is ridiculous. But, um, um, you know, maybe a, a laptop or a personal computer, that would also be okay for. 
Um, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of going, suspending the disbelief and saying, okay, well, you know, file systems is really where it goes, and, and this is a magic box, right, where if we could have that compromise. And I would say there are some applications where that would be worth it. I mean, there might be some applications where you just firewall it in. Um, when Drizzle, which is a fork of MySQL, was first made, there were, everybody could just authenticate to it. And, and everyone's like, just authenticate to the database, and there's, there's no authentication. It's just the plugin for authentication wasn't written yet. And they were like, look, 99% of the time, you just have the application doing its thing, and that's it. You have one application against this database, and that's it. So who cares if like, you know, your blog can authenticate, you just say, okay, it can only come from this machine, and they would have to hack into that machine first. Not that they couldn't do it, they would just have to hack it. There's another level of, of hacking they have to do first. So I would say you know, it, would, it would depend on the functionality, you know, going with um, the, first, you know, the first point made that, that I, I would take it in some circumstances, and in fact, I already have with my phone. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to agree uh, uh, with the point uh, you made. <clears throat> it, a, uh, an OS environment like that uh, with no, um, no controls uh, would be practical only for a purposeful application. And I've uh, heard of some research uh, around this fact. A colleague, a uh, university colleague of mine, had a project called uh, Bear where he, his uh, premise was that he would write applications that would run directly on top of BIOS. Uh, or potentially um, UE a UEFI firmware based. And in that case, all, um, all your uh, controls as far as authentication or uh, ACLs would be within the application itself. And, um, you know, again, if it's a purposeful thing, like, uh, like all it's going to be is a DNS server, as you pointed out, you know, it certainly is a premise that, that could work and perhaps even be more secure than a, a multi user, uh, multi purpose operating system. I'd like to comment about the, the mobile phone example. For Android phones, um, they, they do have a, a good permission model for, for the applications, but uh, almost every application gets permission to write to your SD card or whatever, because you always want to access, store things on there. And that means every photo you take can be accessed by uh, every, almost every uh, Android application, and most of them want to have access to the internet as well. So uh, when they can uh, access all your private data and send it all to the internet, um, sure, they might be protected from each other, but it doesn't matter, matter so much, I think. So, uh, I mean, in, th in theory, the, 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 you weren't quite right, but in practice, you are, because they get no access to share that they can, it doesn't really matter, they can all mess with you anyway. And so, phones that don't really protect you. Okay. So, I would like to um, offer the audience the opportunity uh, to, to join in here. So, if you would like to ask a question, um, either throw your hand up or stand up. Um, and so when they're, they're done, we'll get you to, to next. So you look like you were waving your arm. So arm wavers get called on. It's, it's a really good so, so first of all, my first personal computer had absolutely no security. And it really would have liked to go a little bit faster. It was a 4 megahertz, no, megahertz, not gigahertz, um, thing running CPM. And it worked. Um, that said, any application, you only ran out one application at once. Um, but a much more modern thing of a piece of a television, the, I don't think they've got any security in the tiny Linux kernel that, that a modern TV runs, and they, they, they run quite well. So the issue is whether you have different things that compete, compete for resources or, or information, um, but as long as you're isolating them by having different appliances and things like that, I don't think it's a problem, and getting speed in some of those would be really valuable. Okay, so what's the question? Do they agree? So the, the problem is when your blender can talk to your TV. The day when your blender can talk to your, or I guess these days your fridge could talk to your TV. The okay. TV commercials could go straight to your fridge and say, go order this product. Okay, so I, so I think the panel has just provided the next que question to the panel here. Okay, what is the appropriate security paradigm for your toaster? <laughs> Is it a hey. pop-up toaster or is it a toaster oven? It's a pop-up. Convection or conventional? <laughs> it's conventional. Okay, so anybody want to field that one? I'll call on somebody if nobody fields it. You can have something to think about. <laughs> I'll say there would have to be some kind of age access authentication. I think anyone who can go in my house can make toast or make a pizza in the toaster oven, but I would want them to be over a certain age. I don't want, I don't want a three-year-old using the toaster. Now, granted, we already have that by putting it on a counter, right? So you have to be able to reach the counter to do that. So right, that might you be want security, the... You want security in depth, though. 
Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, you know, and certainly, like in Australia, I can t can't tell you how many times I've plugged something in and not actually pushed the button on the yeah. on the power thing. So there's security there for you know. Um, okay. What if it's a network enabled toaster? But if I'm well, but if I'm drunk at three in the morning, I want to be able to make my waffles. You know, like it can't be too security enabled. Well, I think for toast, you need to have uh, multiple sources of inputs. So you have the, like, like the you know push a button on uh, method. There's also the form of like uh, you know you're lying in bed. You know, I'll get up in a few minutes. So I use my phone to tell my toaster to get, grab a slice of bread and put it in the toast. And you know when it's you know done, then I'll get out of bed to eat it. And right. so for that, for that sort of uh, use, I mean, you want to have uh, you authenticate your, your phone. Maybe have an application on the phone that uh, authenticates itself via SSL, and uh, to make sure that you know you don't have uh, hostile people just toasting all your bread when you're not, in a, not at home. Well, more importantly, setting your house on fire. Right. I would turn the networking off because I wouldn't use that feature. That's my answer to that solution. You don't have to buy the product just because it exists. You're not. Well, I thought you said you were an American. <laughs> I'm also an American with no credit card debt. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, she's the other one. <laughs> All right. So let's let's see if we have a, can can have a There's question. A for, yeah, no, right up there. Oh, hang on. Wait for the mic. Come on. You got run, run. The guy this morning ran. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the coffee maker. Would be the, you want the coffee? That would be a better example. Thank you very much. So going back to the fridge question then. Is it worth or, uh, or practical to try and enforce a minimum set of security rules for a fridge and could it be enforced? How could you go about doing it? Would it be worth it? You mean like don't let the, don't let the teenagers ransack the fridge after one eight, between like 1 a.m. and 7 a.m.? No, well, considering that if you can hook a fridge up to the net, then it's effectively a, or because they can order food for you then it is a target of an attack because it's on your local network and if a PC is compromised you can scan and look for fridges that you know have a certain vulnerability. So yeah, security and home <laughs> appliances. Um, could it be implemented and I suppose should it and how could you go about doing it? Well, let, okay, actually I'm going to take this one because this is a fun question. Uh, imagine if you will your Arnos and um, you decide your, your corporate revenues are down a little bit. You, already, you, you have, have immediately become um, one, of those eight, one of those entities that, that sees real value in hacking your refrigerator so that it will, will order extra Tim Tams. Um, so yeah, but nobody's going to notice if they get more Tim Tams. <laughs> OK. Right. Um, so we've got, we've got one up here. That's what you get for running all the way down here. <laughs> it's like tennis, you got to stick in the middle. That's right. More just a topic oh, of discussion. Oh, no, go ahead. He, he, he's got it now. You can, you can. Sorry. Just hold, Sorry. keep your arm up in the air and then we'll get to you eventually. Just a topic of discussion, more uh, cloud, cloud based and security being introduced there in terms of auditing authentication, two factor authentication, just thoughts and yeah, theories on where it's going, where it should be going. I actually liked the, the Google chip that's coming out. So it's, it's, um, it's still one factor authentication. I mean, it might be two factor because it's your password in the chip, but it's something physical. So I think the problem with any kind of authentication system is if it can be done entirely remotely, there is a world of hackers out there that could eventually get your things. So one factor authentication is right, probably not enough. Two factor, it's two remote pieces of data that you could probably, look, if you want to know what my first pet's name is, um, it's probably on Facebook somewhere if I've had Facebook since I was younger. You want to know what the, what's the best man at my wedding, you know, go look at my wedding photos on Facebook, right? Go look at Twitter, right? What's my, you know, what's, what's the street I used to live on? Like there, there are totally things that you can find just uh, that people are putting out there that they then use as their, as, and, and also as their, um, their I forgot my password question. What year did you graduate high school? Well, you know, that's on my timeline. So I think that it's, it's obvious that the authentications we have aren't good enough. And I like the idea of having something physical, because then somebody has to steal it from me. And that's a, that's a lot smaller population than the entire world of hackers. It might be a couple hundred, couple thousand people that I interact with daily. I could lose my chip or whatever, um, but then somebody would have to know who it was associated with. It's like losing your house key. If you write your ha like house key is great authentication. It's one factor of physical authentication, right? 
So if we hand that for other things, right, then if you lose your house key, unless you wrote your address on your house key, you're probably okay. I mean, you still want to change your locks maybe, but maybe you don't have to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it'd be good to, well, when people write uh, clients for their, for their services, let's we think about these things. I mean, for example, uh, the word, some, some people have written a um, Android client for WordPress. They've also got an iPhone client, which is presumably the same, but I haven't tried it. So the, the Android client for, for WordPress, uh, you enter your, uh, your, your blog URL, your username and password, and logs you in, and you do stuff. Um, but uh, what they should be doing, uh, they, I think it's a bunch of the same people writing the client on the server. So they should be having a, um, uh, some sort of a, a one-time password type thing uh, with code uh, on the, the client generating this code so you know that it's only the same Android phone that's being used. So w when you log into your administrative account on, on WordPress, you set up the, the magic uh, number or whatever, and then only that particular Android phone can be used with the, 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 the user and password to log in to WordPress on your blog. This wouldn't be that hard for them to do, but they haven't done it. And this is very hard for other people to do. So for example, my blog, I've got a, a YubiKey, which is the same technology I believe uh, Google's now using for their one time, uh, for their uh, hardware token thing. And um, so I use that for my uh, PC-based uh, logins to my blog. But for my phone, I've got less security because uh, the, the phone client doesn't support it. And it's been a fairly easy thing for them to do in software, but uh, they haven't done it, unfortunately. So I think what we need is to have you know, more awareness by developers about these things. So I have a question how that works. How does it work with the, with the WordPress to your phone? It's only allowed, that's the only mobile device that's allowed is your phone? Um, but this is, actually I can answer that because Google, the, the two-factor two authentication that Google impli uh, has for the accounts right now, basis on one is you can manage your applications with the one-time password that's generated. Right. So essentially, you, if, you, if you configure your evolution client to have a IMAP address with the password, you get one uh, long I don't know how long it is, it's quite long character yeah, password that you can long. put it in. Yeah. And you don't need a physical key for that. So right. every time that's there, they, it identifies that this is coming from this application. Mm -hmm. And in case it's compromised, you can just disable the application and you don't have to worry about it at all. Right, right. No, I was just wondering about the mobile phone thing you were talking about. Is that similar to, to the Google two-factor authentication? Because it sounded like you were saying you okay. set up your mobile phone and then that's okay. the only so mobile device I'm talking about two things, use my PC and use my, my phone. So for, for uh, logging in with my PC, I, I use this device. And this, uh, you probably see from, even from the back, this is a, a, a little USB device. And uh, you plug it into a PC and it's a keyboard. And you push the button on it and it acts like a keyboard typing a password in. And so a, uh, a one-time password. And so uh, this means that if I log in with this over the internet to any of a number of services, then uh, I can't, someone can't log in twice with the same password. So I log in, they sift the traffic, they can't log in themselves with the password. Uh, on my phone though, I like to have similar functionality. And, and Google has a, um, authentication app for Google services uh, that runs on Android phone. And you run this app and it gives you a, a password that you can then type into a PC uh, or any sort of web browsing device to uh, log into Gmail or any other Google service, I believe. And so uh, this uh, code that, that's generated on, on this uh, Google phone app is uh, in concept the same as the code that's generated by this. But this just comes from a, a hardware token that's like a keyboard, and uh, whereas the other option is uh, on the phone. And they both work uh, fairly well because with the, the uh, Android phone uh, permissions model, uh, this data is stored uh, separately from the other data. So I believe that, um, well, unless Google has made a mistake in their coding, which is always possible, but not that likely, I think, uh, this data is secure from the other apps on the phone. So unless someone cracks root on my phone or uh, steals my phone and disassembles it, uh, my Gmail account password that's stored in this app is safe. And this, again, is also fairly safe. Um, even if someone uh, steals this, they, they, would be, uh, they would have a lot of trouble in taking the key apart. Uh, it's, within, it's easy for a national lab, but for an individual, it's not possible. So you'll have to actually own this device and uh, insert in something to uh, log in my account. But with uh, the WordPress app on my phone, no, that's not needed. All it is is username and password. You sniff the traffic, uh, you get the username and password, and you're in from anywhere. And this can be done so much better. OK, uh, the guy in the blue shirt up there. He's been very patient. It's we should the applaud him. Should be done yeah. um, back to the Internet of Things. I, I, I wanted two questions. One is about your fridge. There's also the matter of privacy. What you keep in your fridge, lots of people would want to know that. The second question, um, your self-driving car, what kind of security would you want on your self-driving car? OK. We're going to start at this end. Uh, well, uh, regarding the fridge, I'll uh, start with that. 
Um, yeah, I guess uh, I recall, you know, when IP version six uh, hit the scene, the idea was, oh, well, we'll have enough IPs that everything in your life could have an IP address, uh, including your refrigerator. I still can't see the use case for that, but uh, nevertheless, um, yeah, I think that uh, there's, there's solutions out there that you can put into something like that. And I'll go back to something I talked about uh, with the, the TPM. You know, it's a $1 commodity chip that you could stick in that could store, uh, securely store some sort of, um, you know, cryptographic key that could use to authenticate your refrigerator to, you know. And you could also use it to, to help um, combat some privacy concerns by having, you know, a place to, to, to store, um, you know, you know key material for a secure connection, that kind of thing. And something like that could be applicable to a car, too. Uh, but my self-driving car, I, I would, I think I would want to control the network access uh, when it's only parked <laughs> in my garage, uh, if it needs to do some updates to the maps or something like that. And then it's totally uh, offline after that. Or um, uh, air gap components. Um, and, uh, you know, this is kind of common, um, you know, like in systems like airplanes and things like that, you either have, you know, uh, systems that are air gapped or you either have them on like a, a very secure hypervisor like a, um, like a green trees uh, green trees oh, I can't forget the name of it. it's green something <laughs> hypervisor that they're they're they specialize in you know these mission critical applications uh, with uh, mathematically proven security so that's the only thing I guess I would trust in a, in a self driving car I mean, I guess with both the fridge and the car, I don't necessarily want, like, do I want my insurance company knowing that sometimes I drive, you know, 100 kilometers, no, 100 kilometers, about 140 kilometers an hour on the highway when it's, you know, 100 kilometers is the limit? Um, probably not. Do I want, uh, you know, do I want the, um, the foods chain, do I want Woolies to know um, that I buy, you know, two heads of lettuce per day, per, per week, and, and half of one goes rotted? Not really. I mean, there are people that don't use the, the lo customer loyalty cards because they don't want people knowing what they buy. And I think that, you know, with the fridge, it's, it's somewhat similar um, for me anyways, that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to know that. Now, I might want to know if I'm at the supermarket and I think, do I have any milk? You know, I would probably want to know. But, you know, it's not going to improve my life that much to know if I have milk. Now, that being said, there might be things that would improve my life. For example, the automated food delivery, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I'm also, you know, in a place where sometimes I'll ask my husband, you know, what I should get from the supermarket. And he goes, well, I don't know what I'm going to want for dinner next week. <laughs> I don't know what you should buy. And I'm like, well, I'm going to buy it. So it's, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think it's, it's important to have the privacy and security. And I think it's also important for us to, to understand the consequences of our own actions, right? So if I say, hey, yeah, sure. I can let the supermarket know uh, when I'm out of something. I, I want them to know. But now the other thing is, how do you know when you're out of something? Does it reside on a certain shelf? Does it do certain things? I mean, like, can I actually get something, some kind of like newfangled dishwasher that can tell me exactly what the optimal place to put the cup is or the, the bowl? Do you put the bowl <laughs> on the top or the bottom? Like, if I could just have that, right? That would be good. So, uh, you know, but coming back to the, the, the fridge in the car, I mean, you know, these are things where we have to think of, do we want these features? To, do we want them on? You know, do we have a choice? I mean, you know, navigation would be great, you know, as standard in every car and that gets some satellite stuff, but that's mostly, um, you know, a, a, a one-way kind of, I'm sending you. It's a, it's a pull mechanism, right? I'm pulling data from the satellite. Hopefully the satellite can't come and pull data from my car. Um, the satellite has its own logs um, and that does its own thing. Uh, but do, you know, do we really want to? Do we really want that data to be out there? Do we really want the next version of CSI to be like? And this was what was in their fridge three hours ago before they cleaned it out. Um, and how do you catalog a human head in the fridge anyway? Um, by the barcode. By the what? The barcode. The barcode. <laughs> that's right. So I mean, I think I think that's a really good question, and and I don't have an answer to it because I think it depends on what different people want. Um, you know, you don't want your family to run out of food. You know, do you use auto pay? And on, if so, on what services? I don't, I use auto pay on certain things that are fixed payments and that give me incentives to do so. I don't use them on my phone because I don't want my phone company to be like, oh yeah, I know you're in Australia and that was like $5,000 worth of calls you made. You know, I want to be able to fight that, right? The phone can be variable every month. So I think similarly, like I wouldn't necessarily want to order more milk just because I'm out of milk. Maybe I'm going away on vacation soon and I want to use up all the milk and I don't want any more. 
So I think that it really depends on the use case. And I hate to say it depends, but you know, I think it does. Um, you have to be careful about physical security too, right? Because you know, with a chip or whatever, that's great. But you know, if your kid can get a hold of it, right, and they can all, all of a sudden read all your email or all your private files, um, maybe you don't want them to know, um, you know where your porn collection is or what, what investments you have, either way. OK, that end of the table. Oh, I'll start. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like Ashuri said, essentially, it comes down to what you value the most for yourself. So what do you think is private for you? What do you think that anybody you, you don't want to share with anybody else? So that being said, me personally, in terms of first going to the fridge, I would probably have a system where I need to authorize a purchase or a weekly schedule or something like that. And I'm OK with that. If, if uh, on every Saturday I get a ping from my fridge on my phone saying, all right, you are out of these things. Shall I go ahead and authorize the payment? Yeah, sure. I can do that. So that, that way I keep, um, I have a certain control over it as well. So it's kind of meeting things halfway. It's not fully automated, but I don't want it to be fully automated. I don't mind being bugged once every week to remind me that I need to buy grocery. That's fine. I'm happy with that. And the same thing with the car as well. As long as I authorize something, even if a self-drive car, do I want it to come to me when I'm stuck in the rain somewhere? Do I want the car to come to me? How do I authorize it remotely? So sometimes in those cases, I would want it to come to me. And in that case, something like a two-factor authentication or something like that, that will allow me to do it securely. I'm happy with that. And I don't really care if uh, people track where I go in that car. I have, if, if, if I don't want somebody to track me, what I'm doing at that particular point, I'll probably not take that car. So it's, it, it, again, it, it comes to the same thing. It depends on what you want to do and what you value is private to yourself. OK. okay. So firstly, for, uh, for a car, I think um, a lot of things people will be concerned about for a car are things that are uh, already are concerns for Android phones and iPhones. So uh, if you have a, an Android phone or iPhone, then uh, uh, either Google or Apple is uh, tracking you wherever you go. They uh, know a lot of information about you. They know everything you do with on the phone. Uh, in, uh, in theory, at least, they won't uh, actually read your email unless you're going through, say, the Gmail service. Um, when I say read, I don't mean actually person read. I mean like you know, store on their servers and statistical analysis or something. I'm not uh, suggesting anything unethical. But um, I, in theory, I mean, a uh, company that uh, produces your phone or, or writes out a for it could do a lot of things that you wouldn't want, and you've got to uh, trust them a lot in that regard. And so for, for the car, I think it's a similar sort of thing. I mean, a, a car, of course, uh, the people who, who uh, run the, the overall service that manages that will know everywhere you go uh, and be able to work out what you do there. So there's a lot of things they'll, uh, in theory, at least know about you. Uh, and uh, you've got to hope that they're not going to be evil about it. Um, so it, I think a lot of things are, you know, are basically the same for phones and cars. The difference is, of course, um, a phone can't make you uh, hit a brick wall 100 kilometres an hour, whereas a car, uh, in theory at least, can. Uh, so you want to be uh, very careful about uh, what happens with the, the uh, code that determines where the car is going. Uh, uh, its radar might stop it from driving directly into a brick wall. It might have hardware to do that. But uh, stopping a car from uh, going uh, the wrong way on a freeway that's uh, a much harder software problem to, to, de to deal with and uh, not something that can be solved with hardware. So uh, I think there's uh, a lot of care will be needed to be taken to isolate the, the uh, controls that make the car go in different directions uh, from the controls that allow you to do, to do things like read your email on the car and give it high-level commands. I mean, the, the code that actually says, I want to go to uh, drive to Canberra, I mean, that's something that's, you know, if it gets spoofed, then it's not so bad. I mean, we've seen the news about the woman who wanted to uh, drive to the station and ended up in a few countries away. You know. It's a bit of an amusing anecdote, and I don't think women uh, suffered from this uh, experience. But you know, if, if your car goes the, the wrong way on a freeway, that's something you're going to suffer from. So uh, I think the main issue is to just uh, have perhaps a very uh, small surface area for attack on the actual uh, code that uh, uh, runs the car and uh, controls the maps for which way you go on roads, etc., to make sure it doesn't uh, go the wrong way on a freeway. And for most other things that uh, could, could go wrong, it's no worse than your phone already is, and uh, everyone seems to already have dealt with that. Can we have a show of hands in the audience? Who has a uh, iPhone or Android phone in their pocket right now? OK, uh, do the other way. Raise your hand if you don't have such a smartphone in your pocket. Similar smartphone. OK, there's like four, five people in the audience, six people. Um, yeah, so the rest of us, um, we're already being, uh, in theory at least, tracked everywhere by, for whatever we do by uh, 
uh, one of the, the uh, phone manufacturers. So we, we've already made our decisions about some of these issues about privacy and who we're going to trust. Uh, I've uh, decided to, to uh, trust uh, Google with you know everything I do in that regard. Um, and uh, some of you would have tried, decided to trust Apple. And uh, we've made decisions in this regard already. OK, so we had a question here, I believe. No? OK, got it, OK. Um, over there. It's got to be a question. <laughs> Uh, so we've touched on the issue of uh, user authentication for devices a bit today with the toasters, cars, fridges. Uh, what kind of um, security uh, procedures do you think we can use to ensure that this concept can be used in a world where more and more the internet's consuming everything in a way that you can't really have a physical connection to something to authenticate it that you actually wanted to do something. Anyway. Well, I think we already had that with online credit, with online shopping and credit cards. You don't have to have the physical card to swipe. You just have to have that. And, and I know you're talking about more concrete things. Um, you know, remote access to things, or you know, you have servers now that you never have to actually rack yourself, right? You, you go on Amazon AWS, you never have to touch it. Um, but, you know, I think it, it all comes down to certain things, and credit cards don't even have two-factor authentication unless you count um, the back, the code on the back as a, as a second factor, but I wouldn't. It's still one card. So, you know, it's a difficult problem, and I mean, credit cards, which are the biggest, right, we use them all the time, and, and we want to use them, and how do we prevent me from using them and, and, and you from not using my card and me from not using his card? And you know, banks have very interesting um, policies about this, and I found out some very, very interesting things about both debit and credit cards, um, about you know, certain credit limits and how they go hand in hand with debit limits. For example, if your credit card number is stolen, at least in the US, um, there is no way that you can have a, a $0 credit limit on your credit card, but not on your debit card. So you would think, look, I can go to a, an ATM, I can put the card in, I should be able to get cash out even though the number was stolen, the credit card number, the ATM should still work. I still have my PIN, whatever. It doesn't work because if it's zero on one, it has to be zero on another. There are certain limits, and there's only about 14 different limits, pairs of limits, and that's one of them. So I think that the banking industry is, um, is doing that, and you know we are starting to have things like chip and PIN, um, which is sort of two-factor authentication, I guess. Um, you know, It's still one of those, if, if someone has a gun to your head or something, they can still get it. So, um, I think it's. I think you're absolutely right that we need to start thinking about that and thinking about the trade-offs we make, right? We like the convenience of online credit cards, right? Online shopping with credit cards. Maybe your your trade-off is you don't do it with your debit card, but you'll do it with your credit card because there are safeties in place. And I think we'll start to see regulations too. Banking didn't always used to have regulations in place that said if somebody you know drains your bank account, you'll get the money back tomorrow or in a week. You know, it used to be six to eight weeks or months of paperwork. Um, so I think that we will start to see, you know, I'm not saying trust the, the companies that are doing it, but I think that there will be enough problems that there will be legislation around this that companies have to safeguard certain things and there has to be certain privacy. Like companies can know that, we, uh, that, that the fridge is empty or full or how much, you know, peanut butter we go through, even though you don't really store that in the fridge. Um, but, and, and maybe they can sell that data to others, but they can't, you know, there's certain things they can't, like how many times you open the fridge, I don't know. There would be some kind of regulation on those. Anyone else? Okay, so I think that one thing that's uh, missing in a lot of uh, systems is hardware controls. So, for example, this is my phone, and it's got a, a nice camera here, and it's got a camera on the other side. So, if I want to do a, a video conference call, I can just talk to my phone. These are nice features. Now, I put my phone down. I put it down this way, and the big camera is facing up. I put it down the other way, and the little camera is facing up. No matter what I do, if I'm, my phone is not in my pocket, it, the camera is pointing at something that's uh, possibly useful to an attacker. This phone is always on the internet. Uh, this phone is one model that had a, a security flaw in it, and I, I'm not sure if, if it's been patched to, to fix that flaw. So if I installed the wrong application from the Android market, in theory at least, my phone could be owned by someone who could then be taking uh, pictures of us right now. So uh, when I hold this phone up to, just to uh, make a point to the audience, uh, someone could take a, a picture of you and send it across the internet without you knowing about it. Uh, what I, I would like to see is a, a shutter on, on the phone. So I could just flick a, a bit of uh, hardware across and the, the, the camera is uh, closed, uh, and then even if someone else was uh, doing something hostile with this phone, it couldn't have a picture because there's a bit of uh, metal or something across it. And also for the microphone, uh, there's no hardware for the microphone. Well, you've got that on your phone. That's nice. It's not my phone. 
Okay, my phone does have that. And the microphone as well. Uh, there's no way of shutting the microphone down. So uh, software can enable this microphone at any time. Could you listen to us right now? This conversation is not secret. Other conversations are. My phone's in my pocket. Who knows what's happening? Uh, so uh, it would be ideal if we had a, a way of just shutting this up, like click a little switch on the side to turn off the microphone. And uh, you'd add uh, maybe you know, a dollar to the price of the phone. I'd pay a dollar extra for a phone that had that. Uh, who, he would pay extra for a phone that had harbor controls to turn off these things. Well, it's not just not everyone, it seems, unfortunately. For cars, too. I mean, like, that would be more important for things like cars, right? You have the, so you're talking about physical blocks. Yeah. You know, so like the car, you, we, they have what, the, the club or whatever that you can across the, <laughs> the thing. And, you know, it's not 100% effective. You can cut out the steering wheel, right? But they're going to pass over your car if they see that. So I think, I think that's, a good, I, that's a good point that, you know, maybe they can engage the car. They can turn on the car remotely, but it won't be able to steer. Because Ooh. the wheels can't turn because well, it's attached to the steering wheel. It's different and things. How's the software going to detect that? Yeah, that's okay. going to be that's scary in Secondly. itself. Can I just ask a question? Who here has uh, used uh, an Android phone or iPhone when they are uh, in the bathroom uh, or uh, getting changed or in other ways not wearing the normal amount of clothes? Can I have a show of hands? Who's willing to put their hand up for that? Yeah, but if you do that though, yeah. the phone is on the ground and looking up. Right? No, it's so like you, you, you're you're getting dressed and you're getting an email and you go, okay, I'll read my email now. You know, the, the phone can be seen. But you. it's looking at my face. I don't say, let me look at my email now. <laughs> you haven't read his email. <laughs> Let's not go there. Anyway. Um, <laughs> hey, good point. When you've got a, a camera on each side, I mean, having neither of those cameras point towards any part of you you don't want seen by random people on the internet, it's a bit of a challenge if you're going to be reading email and stuff. And you don't really think about that. You want to just have, you know, a bit of uh, metal or plastic going across the thing and say, okay, the shutter's closed. Um, even if something goes wrong, they can't see me. Okay. Good point. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Do you want features or security? Security. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Uh, you could have a, have, a, have a switch on the side, a hardware switch that locks down all those sensors and just say, okay, I own my phone sensing nothing. I just go click, you know, uh, microphone's off. No, you, no, no, you don't. You can't want to, take the battery out of an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. well, okay, okay, you can, but okay, we've got time for one more question here. Now, he, he had you decline. Okay, so, so, okay, and this better be a question. So, a really fundamental question: Can you actually make software secure enough? Right, I and mean, we're talking about complex applications, not a hello world program. If it's, if it's secure enough, it means that uh, you know this is the value of my data, and I want to uh, secure it to that value and not much more. Then, uh, in many cases, yes. If it's a case of um, I want this software to stay in the field running for ten years non-stop and, and uh, with instant access and have no one uh, crack it, then uh, no, probably. Go ahead. Uh, man, that's that's a tough. I don't I don't believe so. I don't. I think that all software will always have flaws. I think that the, essentially, you know, it, it's about managing risk and what risk you're willing to take. Um, like with the phone and your camera that you're speaking of, um, it's just it's just something that that we you know accept. And there, there's certainly no um, coincidence to the fact if you ever work in a secure space, government space, that first thing you know you have to leave the phone in the car because. You know that these things are very easily easily compromised, and you know as more complex uh, systems get, uh, it, you know, the, the harder it's going to be to to find these flaws um, and uh, and deal with them. And uh, I believe that you know there's certain things that we could do to really help mitigate risk, and we're not doing them. And that's something that um, you know I like to see um, cryptographically verified code modules would be go, go a good long way. And you know, certainly Apple has tried to do it, and it's always seems somebody figures out a way to break it. Digital signatures, um, you know, the hardware root of trust thing that I've mentioned several times. I mean, it's a good starting point to try to, you know, at least know that what is running on there is what you know you think it should be. Now, nevertheless, you know, nonetheless, that code could be flawed, but at least you know it's that particular version, and you know it's in that state. So. There's some things out there that can go a long way, and then um, you know, with the uh, the trend of outsourcing to uh, cloud, uh, it's a plus and minus. So you know, there could be uh, 
your applications could very well be more secure in the cloud if you're dealing with a provider that really knows what they're doing. If you're providing baseline operating systems that have controls turned on that maybe you wouldn't in your, in your inside organization because your administrator doesn't know what he's doing. So, you know, there's, there's some trends that, that help mitigate risk, but so defect-free software is highly unlikely. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna call an end here. So, as an audience, were the best answers from this side of the table or this side of the table? Okay, let's have hands for this side of the table. Okay, let's have hands for this side of the table. Okay, by acclamation, it's this side of the table. All right, from, so now, was it the center of the table or the end of the table? Uh, center of the table. End of the table. Okay, we, okay, we have our winner. Now, who gets it? If you asked a question and you want this, raise your hand. <laughs> well, you don't get it because you obviously weren't here this morning to know that Casey had won the uh, smart in monitor. The, it's, it's a real-time home electricity monitor uh, that works in Australia and New Zealand. So if you want it, so I saw the man in blue back there and you here. And, um, oh, this is a tough one, huh? You want a coin? Okay, we should, let's, let's have them both come down. Both come down here. We'll get the sumo uh, wrestling suits out and... Um... <laughs> okay, no, no, let's, let's get them both to come down here. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll... So you get to ultimately decide here, but we have to... We'll, we'll present your contestants here. And I'm okay then... with letting the audience vote too, by the okay. way. Okay. Between so, these two. Well, you... you okay, you, get, no, you, you come over here. Com. Okay, you stand there, you stand there together. Com. Okay. Oh, yeah, wait. Does anyone have access to the internet? Well, everyone does. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I couldn't okay. get a route out. So okay. do Google fight on, on their first names? Unless they both... No, are. both are names. No, no, no. Why? Okay. okay. Yeah, or... Lizard Spock. <laughs> no, someone Google... What are your first names? What's Steven your, with the PH. Steven with a PH? Josh. Josh. Okay, someone Google fight that. Steven versus Josh. Anyone? Bueller? I think Josh is going to win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a PH, Steven with yeah, Google fight. Who's the victim? Yeah, it's like a Google fight, but it um, has a number of results. 470 billion for Steven. <laughs> 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 How many Joshes? He's working on it. He's doing I'm just doing it manually. He's doing it oh. himself. 280 billion for Josh. So, so Steven might. Steven with PH is the... There you go. Surprising. I thought Josh was going to win that. Okay. Well, Joshua might have more. Okay. Well, we'll thank the panel. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.